I think that we can start now. Hello, I'm Heraklis uh, Kazadoulis from the National Documentation Center of Greece. I would like to welcome you all to the Triple Open Science Training Series, uh, which is organized by VP6 of the Triple Project. Today's uh, webinar is uh, organized in cooperation with um, uh, VP8. And the topic, its topic is uh, fair data in SSH. The uh, moderator uh, for today is Arno Zingold. Arno has been working for Operas a few years. He is currently part of the Operas coordination team as the fair data, fair data officer and the project manager for the Co-Operas Go Fair implementation network on the verification of SSH. Uh, concerning the triple project, he is the task leader of the data acquisition task. So Arno, thank you very much for being here with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Arakis. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. In this uh, training series of uh, training event of triple that for data in SSH, uh, sorry, I'm working with my laptop. So sometimes I have uh, issues with the full screen, but uh, we will manage. So the, um, some info first about housekeeping of the today's uh, webinar. So the session uh, will be recorded. It will be made available uh, afterwards. And uh, you can follow uh, the, the future uh, events of the uh, training by Triple on the Triple website with uh, using the link that is indicated here, gotriple.eu slash training. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of this um, training. And of course, the questions are very welcome to have a lively discussion on this topic. You can send them in the chat during the, the webinar. Um, I will take care of collecting and present, presenting them to, to the speaker. And uh, so the, about the, the upcoming events, precisely the next one will be on the EOSC architecture. It will be on uh, October 12th uh, this year, and it will be the same hour. Then today, <coughs> and the presenter, <coughs> excuse me, will be Vire Ten Huden from EGI uh, for the triple trading events. So this is something that you can find again on the Google website. So today the topic is fair data uh, in SSH and uh, it will be uh, presented by <coughs> uh, my colleague, Elena Gilia. Elena Gilia, uh, we've been working together in Operas for quite some time. And uh, just to give you a few information about her, I will have to, unfortunately, to uh, Stop sharing my screen <coughs> to not uh, forget anything. So Elena, she is head of the Open Science Office of the University of Turin, and she has been part of the European Open Science Network since many years, attending national and European and international conferences. She is uh, <coughs> writing and lecturing on open access and open science, and she takes part as an expert in several EU workshops on open access and open science. And she's especially one of the coordinators, <coughs> excuse me, cooperation implementation network within GoFair. And uh, she is part of the Opera's Executive Assembly, and she represents uh, Opera's also in the EOSC uh, Association. So the main goal to, of uh, today's webinar is to answer uh, two questions. Um, uh, regarding research data in the SSH, why the FAIR principles are important for the management of research data in the SSH, and how can the FAIR principles be implemented in the SSH. So, um, like you know, the FAIR principles uh, appeared in 2016 and soon became key in the new context of data-driven science, and it um, became also key in the context of the uh, in EOSC building. And I, I guess that Elena will tell you more about that. Just uh, to, to, as an introduction, uh, the FAIR principles, they were first mainly uh, targeting the data and they have been extended to actually um, any type of digital object, including for instance, software. So it offers 
they offer this fair principle, a powerful framework to make any digital object findable, available, and even, if possible, uh, directly processable. And uh, this generic aspect of the fair principles uh, uh, represents their strengths, but also it requires, it implies that you have to adapt them to specific communities, specific objects, and so on. This is the case, especially uh, in the SSH, and this is the case, more specifically, even in the, the case of uh, with uh, Triple, uh, the platform which um, uh, harvests um, in metadata information from a variety of objects, uh, from publications, data sets. And in fact, the Drupal platform relies itself on the FAIR principles in the sense that it uses data that has been verified and it produces also data that uh, is verified further. And uh, this is uh, a verific verification process that is, it is a path there on which uh, we are going and precisely this is what Elena will tell you more about right now and uh, she is the perfect person to give you all the information on this topic and I'm sure I will learn some things myself. So Elena, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, thank you for having me, even uh, though it was a bit an hectic morning, so I'm not at my best, but anyway, I, now I'm going to uh, share my screen, and as, yeah, can you see it now in presentation mode? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm um, switching off my video as I'm working from home, so the connection is not so so good. Uh, so see you later for the question and answer. So uh, let's see. Okay, it, it's almost um. I would say it's a mission impossible uh, to give you an overview because I what I what I can give you in 45 minutes it's like a, an overview of uh, fair data and uh, and the humanities. Um, the slides, of course, will be available later. Uh, I think on Zenodo, and this is here. This is what we are going to see today. So, um, what is data? in the social sciences and mostly in the humanities, uh, something about the FAIR principles and some tools on with whom you, you, you can make your data uh, FAIR. And really a, a, a really overview, a really introduction, a short introduction on how to draft a, a data management plan. So we have some players in this field of uh, fair data in the social sciences and humanities. Uh, first of all, there is uh, ALEA, this ALEA uh, report, sharing uh, sustainable and fair data sharing uh, in the humanities, which was published last year. And um, as you will see, will be like the pillar of, of this uh, presentation. But then of course, we have the work that uh, Cooper has, uh, made, uh, listening to the communities. So here in the link, as you see here in, in the slides, you will have the links uh, to all the sources. Um, you find the reports of the five uh, workshops we held in uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, listening to the needs uh, of the community. Then, of course, one of the bigger uh, players is uh, um, DARIA, so the, the infrastructure for data in the humanities. And here you see uh, this pathfinder to data management best practices in the humanities, um, uh, written by uh, Erzbet Totsifra. Then you have this, I would say, a very practical uh, guide on uh, verified data uh, produced by the Partenos project, which was um, a, a Horizon 2020 project, which ended in uh, um, 2020. And then, of course, you have Operas. You know that Tri Tripoli is uh, linked to the Operas infrastructure. And um, during the last 
uh, Horizon 2020 funded project, which is called Opera SP. Uh, in War Package 6, uh, we produced a, a report on uh, the future of scholarly communication. And if you go to chapter three, uh, you will see um, the road to fair uh, social sciences and humanities. Uh, so this is another, let's say, important uh, tool. Then the ALEA report you see here, uh, it, it's really, I would say a masterpiece because you have the, they, they started from the whole cycle of, um, of data. So the, the research data life cycle, as you see here, and then they give you a recommendation for each step and uh, a recommendation taking into account the fair principles for uh, each step. So it's really, I would say, um, a pillar for um, managing data in a fair way in the humanities. But first, first of all, is data still a dirty word in the social sciences and humanities. Because you see at the Munich conference in 2018, uh, this was a discussion among me and a researcher in the humanities. Uh, and she was saying, are humanities disciplines only considered valid if we call them data? In other words, can we not accept different kinds of research methodologies as valid on their own terms rather than on those imported from or imposed by other fields? So that's, the, that's a common attitude in the, in the humanities. But again, if you look at the, at the ALEA uh, report, uh, this is very clear. So in the humanities, we all use research data, although we might not be aware of it. Uh, you are using data even if you don't know it, and once you realize it, it will affect your research workflow uh, forever. So that, that's the, <clears throat> let's say, let, that's the foreword uh, of the entire um, report. But it's not that you don't have data in the humanities. Problem is that you use uh, a more precise terminology like primary source, uh, secondary sources, uh, critical edition, annotations, bibliographies, uh, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, and that depends on the fact that data in the humanities are also, let's say, uh, an effect of an interpretation, okay? So it's never raw, the data in the humanities. And that's precisely uh, what um, the community told us during the first uh, <clears throat> workshop that operas, that cooperas organized the entering. So data are never raw in the humanities, are always expression of a method or uh, an epistemology or a political view. There is always a choice. And there is always interpretation. There is always a subjectivity, okay? In the humanities, you don't have data generated by a machine. And another, let's say, uh, Another reason why uh, data are different in the humanities is that they are discussed, okay? They are not taken for granted as they don't come out from, uh, from a machine. And in the humanities also, you can have books uh, as data, okay? Because they, they are the source uh, for uh, further research or further interpretation. So the community gave us also um, some definition of data, uh, like anything you can formalize uh, through a language or uh, something which is more a record than uh, data. And you could also have a distinction uh, among weak documents, um, which are mere uh, registrations, and strong documents, like when you have some uh, kind of human uh, intervention. And you also can uh, think about data as a process because they are uh, dynamic and diachronic. Anyway, in my opinion, uh, the best definition of data uh, is the one that we find in the ALEA report again. Uh, so we could define data uh, broadly 
as all materials and assets scholars collect, generate, and use during all stages of the research uh, cycle. Okay, so that, that's a great definition of data. As you see in the first recommendation of the ALEA report, think of all your research assets as research data that could be potentially reused by other. Consider how useful it would be for you, for your own work, if others share uh, their data. Okay, so this is the first step uh, today in our uh, path toward uh, fair, fair um, data. Uh, <clears throat> I can recommend you to read uh, this uh, article, ERB Dragons, Open Access to Research Data in the Humanities, uh, because the, there is a recognition that uh, data in the humanities are different, but there is also a recognition of the need uh, to create this broad culture of fair data sharing uh, in the humanities and the need to uh, roll up our sleeves, okay, to bridge the gap uh, with other uh, dis disciplines. In uh, dealing with data, uh, once that we have defined data, uh, I would say we have three steps. So uh, hopefully uh, all our data uh, should be open. You know, the principle is as open as possible, as close as necessary. But if your data are not fair, is not only uh, useless, I would say, uh, because if you have no licenses, if you have no documentation, uh, it's almost impossible to understand your data. But it's also risky because uh, other researchers uh, could uh, misinterpret your data or could also misuse your data. But if your data are not properly managed from the beginning, from day one, uh, making them fair could be so time consuming uh, that it could be almost impossible okay, to make them fair. And by the way, we are in the, in the era of EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. So uh, in, the, in this particular, um, let's say historical moment, uh, fair data and managed data uh, tend to overlap because we are um, talking about data fair by design, meaning that when, when you manage your data, you need to manage your data in a fair way, okay? But managing data properly is in the primary interest. So we are still in a, in a let's say, in the realm of self-interest for a researcher, because once you uh, manage your data, uh, the, your whole uh, research process uh, will result uh, streamlined and uh, more uh, effective. So uh, coming to fair data, uh, fair data and fair principles, uh, here we, we go with the fair principles, uh, they have to be machine readable. So what we are going to see today is not just for humans, but also for uh, machines. Here you have the, the article published in, um, in Nature in 2016. And to be findable, you need persistent identifiers and you need metadata. To be accessible, you need to know where to find the data and under what access conditions, and you need open formats. And I start saying it now, but I will keep saying it forever. Accessible does not mean open. You can have perfectly fair data, which are still closed for any uh, responsible reason, okay? So in fact, the acronym is FAIR, Findable Accessible, and, the, and it's not FOIR, Findable Open, okay? So you simply, you just need to know where to find the data and the uh, condition to access them. Then to be interoperable, you need standards and ontologies, and to be reusable, you need licenses and uh, documentation. So these are the FAIR uh, principles. As we were saying, fair does not mean uh, open. Of course, uh, being the um, underlying principle as open as possible, uh, there will be an increase, uh, an increasing overlap uh, between fair and open. 
but as I was saying, there will always be uh, perfectly closed uh, fair uh, data. And I can give you um, an example, uh, which is a researcher here at the University of Turin, and she was dealing with uh, political refugees in Latin America. So if you make uh, this kind of data open, you will put the lives uh, of these people at risk. But if I'm a, a researcher interested in this data, I need to know that the data exists, uh, where to find them, and under what uh, access condition, which can be uh, even a non-disclosure uh, agreement. Okay, so that, that's an important uh, point. Uh, Again, these are the fair principles, the, 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 let's say the actual uh, fair principle. Uh, they are very technique, as you, as you, technical, as you, as, you can, uh, as you can see. Again, accessible does not mean uh, open. If you want to go for um, fair, day, fair principles in a nutshell, uh, you can use this uh, uh, infographic. Uh, created by the Australian Data Service. It's not just an infographic. If you click on each of the icon, you will uh, um, find, uh, let's say, uh, an, an incredible number of uh, resources, uh, training uh, resources, uh, explanation on what the principle means, uh, guides, whatever you really need uh, to go uh, fair. And then if you want to have an idea of um, fair data, uh, let's say at work, uh, you can go and, and watch this video. It's just four minutes um, because idea about, um, about fair data, it was produced by GoFair. And you can see here how uh, data stay where they are, okay? It's the train which is of algorithm, software, whatever, uh, which goes and uh, calls at the station, uh, which are the data. Uh, it records uh, useful for this uh, specific uh, research uh, query, okay? But the data stay uh, where they are, okay? So that, 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 that's why it's important that you describe, you correctly uh, describe your data with rich metadata, uh, because if not, um, the fair train uh, will not call at your station, will ignore uh, your data. And, and that's why it's important to make our data fair, because if not, uh, the humanities will be, uh, let's say, excluded from the, um, let's say, from the fair process and the EOSC uh, process, because you know that fair data are the building blocks of, uh, of the EOS, the European Open Science Cloud. If you want another example uh, <clears throat> of the of FAIR at work, um, you can have a look at this presentation at OAI 12 last week. Um, it, it's, it's about Vodan uh, Africa. So in Africa, uh, Professor uh, Marian von Reisen and Francisco Ladipo, they created a FAIR data point and it's, it's particularly useful because it was linked to the COVID pandemic. So you can see how FAIR data can help um, in case of emergency like the COVID uh, pandemic. <clears throat> if you want to deal uh, with FAIR data, uh, you need to uh, go for this recipe from Vienna. And seeing my fo this photo, I forgot to tell you that you, of course, we have the slides and you have no copyright issue because all the photos are mine. So you can reuse uh, also the photos. They have a Creative Commons uh, license on, uh, on Flickr. So uh, if you want to deal uh, with data, with FAIR data, um, the starting point should be this turning fair into reality report issued in Vienna, because you see the first recommendation, define fair for implementation. Because fair, uh, fair are principles, okay? They are not standards. So every and each community should uh, implement uh, the fair principles uh, in their specific field or in their specific discipline, okay? And then the second recommendation, <clears throat> implement a model uh, of a fair 
a digital object. And the fair digital object is like this. So at the center, at the core, you have the digital object, which can be really uh, whatever you want, data, code, even a book. Then you have a layer of uh, persistent and unique identifiers. Then you have a layer of standards and code. And then the most external layer is a layer of metadata because with metadata, you give the description and you give also the contextual documentation. And basically you make your data findable. If you want to go for uh, air, you must aware that it's not only uh, it's not only up to you okay as you can see in, in this um, uh, wonderful let's say fact sheet uh, created by a swiss uh, data competence center um, you have the translation in plain words uh, of what a fair principle is then you have a column which is the search responsibility and then you have a column which shows you uh, what a good repository is taking care of. So it's a mix of researchers, uh, intervention, human intervention, and uh, something very technical uh, repositories are taking care of. Then in the, in the EOSC, in the process uh, towards EOSC, we have also these uh, six recommendations for implementation of fair practices. And you see that the recommendation uh, is different um, depending on uh, your status, okay? So if we are research institutions, we have uh, mostly to deal with fair um, uh, awareness, uh, training, education, but also with rewards and uh, recognizing uh, the efforts the community makes to make their data uh, fair. So again, it's a matter of uh, research uh, assessment uh, criteria. Then we have this other uh, report, uh, which is really uh, useful because it's about the digital skills uh, for fair and open science. It used to be um, one of the EOSC uh, working groups. And as you see here, uh, depending on your role, uh, you have specific skills uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, or to, to, to have. Uh, in order to make uh, your data fair and to be included uh, into the EOSC. So if you need some uh, training, uh, you can go to SHOC, uh, which is one of, one of the other, uh, you know, main players in, uh, in this field. And I couldn't recommend it uh, more because you have the, this uh, training discovery toolkit. So you, you can choose whatever you need. Uh, but you also have a series of uh, workshops and webinars. Uh, you can see I, I've picked one, which is um, tools and resources for fair data, which might be uh, of interest for, uh, for you. But you also have this uh, CESDA, you know, CESDA is the other infrastructure uh, dealing with social sciences, the European infrastructure, and they uh, produce this data management expert guide, uh, which is really a masterpiece, I would say. Uh, you have seven uh, modules. Uh, you can, uh, of course, it's for free. Uh, you can go at your pace. But what, it, what I particularly like uh, about the data management expert guide by CESDA uh, is that uh, in the end, you have at the end of each uh, module, you have a a section which is called adapt your DMP. So again, it's very practical and uh, um, it, it, it helps you uh, applying uh, in concrete, concretely applying uh, what you learned to your uh, DMP, to your data management plan. Then for uh, the social sciences and humanities, the, the project Partenos, uh, which we have uh, already seen is again, so rich, rich in training material, um, in uh, in uh, training modules, and again for free and uh, at your pace. You have also other tools for SSH, um, for instance, the Daria uh, Gateway, the Open Methods uh, blog, or uh, Ariadne, which is specific for uh, the community of logical studies. If you need support, we have the Fair Data uh, Forum. 
if you um, need some, um, say, specific fair principles for library archives and museums, uh, meaning for, for cultural heritage, um, you have an, a proposal for some standards. Because it, as, as we saw, the first uh, rule, uh, the first recommendation in fair is uh, define fair for implementation in specific fields. So here we are going to see some, uh, again, tools or uh, best some, some best practice. Then we have the FAIR cookbook, uh, which is uh, community driven again, uh, stemming from, a, from an 2020 project. It's not tailored for the social sciences and humanities, but it gives you some really very basic Okay, basic um, recipes to buy your data. Another interesting uh, tool is the FAIR toolkit. So what I'm showing you is uh, anything you need to uh, start this process, okay? Because out there, it's plenty, as you can see, it's plenty of material uh, because everyone is interested in FAIR at the moment. And particularly the FAIR toolkit comes from the industry. Okay, it's really very uh, useful for anyone because it's very uh, practical. Okay, so uh, it's really target oriented. So I recommend uh, also or, also the Fair Toolkit. And one important message coming from the from the Fair Toolkit is that to verify your assets. I would say to verify your data, or as Arnaud was saying, your uh, software, your methodology, uh, your protocol, your whatever. So every block of the research life cycle can be verified. Uh, you need to identify your verification target. Then you have to uh, analyze the data and the metadata to define a semantic data model, uh, to make data linkable. Uh, and then to assess the fairness of your data. And then it's an iteration. Okay, you go for another objective. It's a step-by-step -step process. You can't verify 100% uh, of your data uh, overnight, okay? So that, that's why it's important this idea of the process and this idea of the iteration of, um, of the verification uh, process. And of course, sorry, uh, of course, to verify your data, uh, you need uh, some, uh, you know, uh, support team, but the team should be led by a data steward. Data stewards is the, the let's say, I would say the, um, a new profession, okay, a new professional figure. Uh, it has been estimated that we would need half a million data stewards to manage data, uh, fair data. Uh, within the EOSC uh, ecosystem. And the perfect profile uh, of a data steward is that um, I would say in he or she needs to have um, specific data domain uh, competencies, okay? So in my opinion, a data steward can't be the librarian because first of all, you need competencies on, on, on data, for instance, on archeological data or um, bioinformatic data, or I would say, uh, I don't know, uh, social sciences uh, data. Uh, and then on top of that, you got uh, technical skill, uh, legal skills and so on and so forth. But the core of the competencies of a data steward should be uh, domain, uh, competencies. If you uh, look at the Dutch example, because you know that the Netherlands is uh, at the forefront in, um, in uh, training uh, data stewards, uh, you need, you know, uh, it's, it's urgent, okay, to, to have this sort of structured uh, training uh, for uh, data stewards, but it's also uh, urgent to, uh, let's say, to hire them. So they have to be part of the human resources um, in a research performing organization and not just part of a project. Because if a project uh, end in, um, ends in, uh, in three years, then the data steward will be gone 
Okay, so as Baron Mons uh, was saying in, a, in an article in Nature, uh, funders need to invest at least 5% of research fund in ensuring that data are reusable. It is irresponsible to support research, but not data stewardship. So this is another important uh, preliminary message. Oh, sorry. And then uh, let's go to the fair principles and to the fair uh, data, uh, let's say, from, from a technical point of view. Uh, why I, I've put this title as fair as possible? Because the verification process is a process, okay? So uh, you don't, it's not binary. It's not that you uh, either have fair data or you don't have fair data. You can have data fair for, let's say, uh, 30% or 50% or 100%, but it's a sort of approximation, okay? So it's a process and we should think in terms of as fair as possible. Uh, to assess if your data are fair, uh, you have this precious tool uh, created again um, by the uh, Australian uh, Data Center. It's a self-assessment tool. So it's really useful as a first approach to fair data, because as you see, uh, it makes you some uh, interesting questions. Like, does the data set have any identifier assigned? And then you have a drop down menu and you can say no identifier, uh, single identifier, persistent identifier. And according to your answers, uh, it gives you a score again, again, because a verification is a process. So it gives you a score. But what's the problem with this tool, uh, which is really uh, useful as a first approach, as I was saying, uh, problem is it's subjective. So it's human uh, readable, okay? But we said that the FAIR principles are machine uh, readable. So you need something more uh, objective. Th this can be, you know, the first step just to, um, just to ask you the right question. Then you have the FAIR aware, which is similar, but more detailed. And uh, it was created by the FAIR's FAIR project, which, which is another of the leading uh, players in this uh, in this field. Um, what I like uh, about this tool, which again is human, so it's subjective. Um, so I, I can I can tell uh, I, I can take the survey and I can tell you that my data set uh, is assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. But when a machine goes there and can't find the persistent identifier, my answer is worth what I would say, nothing, okay? But what I, would, I, I like, I particularly like um, about this um, tool is that if you answer, if your answer is no, it opens a very short, uh, let's say, um, fact sheet uh, about uh, persistent identifier in this case, okay? And it's very short. So again, it's very practical. It's very useful uh, as a first step for our uh, researchers. But then you have the objective, okay? The objective tool, which is the fair maturity evaluator. So here is mach machine readable as the fair data and fair principles are. So you simply put your, your uh, DOI um, here and then the machine goes and tests if uh, you comply and you uh, conform to the um, fair principles. And another, um, let's say, in beta, uh, a similar service was created by uh, Fair's Fair and it's called Fuji. Uh, for the time being, you only see demos, but it's really um, helpful. And again, it's machine readable. So you simply put the persistent identifier of your data set, and then it's the machine uh, checking uh, for uh, your compliance to uh, Fair uh, principles. Uh, this is very general, what we said uh, until now. Uh, now let's go uh, deeper into some uh, preliminary issues about fair data uh, in, the, in the humanities. Um, and again, they come from the workshops we held with uh, Cooperas. Uh, in which step uh, 
uh, should the fair principles uh, be applied? Uh, in which language? Because you know that in the humanities, we still use uh, national languages. Uh, sh so should we go for national languages or should we go uh, for English for um, interoperability reasons? Um, then we have a lack of uh, data and metadata skills uh, among researchers. Um, we need to preserve the specificity of how uh, we do research in the humanities and maybe uh, it's, it's us, the, the researchers, uh, who use the, the resources uh, without asking how data were created or described. So maybe we are part uh, of the problem. And of course, we have the, an absolute need uh, of a registry of existing tools. But as I was showing you, uh, both the um, shock and fair fair projects are dealing uh, with that and also uh, operas and cooperas are dealing with that. Uh, the issue of incentives and reward is, is crucial because of course, making your data fair and mostly in the humanities, it's time consuming. So it's a huge effort and then, and then you need to be uh, rewarded uh, for that. So coming back again to the ALEA report, uh, as you can see here, awareness of the fair principles and willingness to adopt them is not sufficient to transform data practices in any discipline. The paradigm shift requires effort and this effort, which impacts on many roles in the research and higher education sectors, requires incentives, support and recognition for adoption to be successful. So these are really the uh, preliminary uh, issues. And why is it so difficult in the, uh, in the humanities? Because in the humanities, often data are uh, collected. Uh, they are not uh, autonomous products. Uh, they come from the cultural heritage. So you, there is, um, uh, uh, let's say the difficult stays, uh, for instance, in the um, in the fact that you don't know who owns the rights. Okay, uh, you know who, who curated, who uh, who created. Sometimes, uh, uh, if you have a digitized collection, you don't know who is the right owners, and so on and so forth. Maybe you can have, um, let's say, uh, an uneven uh, quality of metadata, uh, an uneven level uh, of description of your resources. So um, that's why uh, that, that's where the different the difficulties uh, lays. Uh, going into details, because we are, we are almost uh, running out of time, to be findable, you need metadata. If you don't know what metadata are, you can go and refer to this, but you have different kind of metadata descriptive, the metadata of provenance, technical metadata, right and access, preservation, and citation uh, metadata. So you need to um, describe uh, your data, your resources uh, in the richest possible way, okay? So in the most detailed uh, possible uh, way. And if you don't know um, if your community is using uh, standards, you can refer to the RDA metadata directory. Uh, RDA, again, uh, Research Data Alliance is one of the player, of course, in the, in the data arena. Uh, to be findable, you need metadata. So if you uh, need to create a metadata profile, you can go to the recipe in, uh, in the FAIR uh, cookbook. But you, to be findable, you also need persistent identifier. So to be findable, you need metadata and you need persistent identifier. And you have uh, identifier for objects, uh, the digital object identifier, the DOA, DOI, sorry. But you also have identifiers, for instance, for, for people like the ORCID or uh, for uh, institution uh, with ROR. Okay, so uh, the more you use persistent identifier, the more all the people in the object of, of, of the research cycle will become 
um, blocks, okay? So it's also a matter of uh, really streamlining your, your process because, um, for instance, things uh, through a protocol, okay? Uh, if you deposit your protocol, if, you, if the protocol um, is given a, a persistent identifier, then when you write your next article, you don't have to describe the protocol again you simply recall your protocol um, via the DOI uh, of the deposited uh, item, okay? So that's the idea behind uh, persistent uh, identifiers. Uh, here you go with the specific recommendation of the ALEA report uh, about, about uh, findability, okay? Again, standardized terminology, metadata, and so on. To be accessible, so to be findable, you need metadata and persistent identifier. To be accessible, and again, uh, these are uh, perfectly uh, fair uh, ways of accessing a data set, which can be open um, for registered user, restricted, or uh, embargoed, okay? So, and it's perfectly fair you need somewhere to deposit your data. So basically you need a repository, which can be Zenodo. Uh, I, I recommend Zenodo because it's for free. Uh, it's uh, powered by the CERN in Geneva. So it's completely, let's say, uh, trustfully. Um, and you can create also a community. For instance, if you are funded um, by the European Commission, so you have an acronym for your project, you can, cre can create a community, and then you can put uh, every output of your project uh, in there. And of course, you get a DOI, so every item uh, becomes uh, citable. You can also use uh, Dataverse, you can use Dryad, you can use Figshare, uh, they are uh, all uh, valuable um, tools in order to deposit uh, your data. For the humanities, you can also go to Humanities Commons because Humanities Commons, which is this wonderful project, uh, which is a sort of community really uh, for the humanities, um, it has also a repository, okay? So you can deposit uh, your data, your sources, your work in the Humanities Commons. If you uh, are uh, searching, if you're looking for a repository, then you have to go to Ray3 Data, which is the registry of research data repositories. And maybe you can find the most um, suitable uh, um, repository for your specific uh, discipline. Because again, here is a matter of convergence, okay? You not only have to converge to some standards, but you also have to create a sort of critical mass, okay? So it's pointless to scatter uh, our data in uh, zillions of, of repositories. So try to converge to the repository your community is using and try to adopt the standards, uh, for instance, the ontology, the metadata schema that your community is uh, already uh, using. In order to be accessible, you need a place, so a repository, but you also need uh, open formats, okay? And here you have uh, this uh, schema. So for instance, um, an Excel file uh, is not accessible. So you have to convert your Excel file into a CSV one, and you have um, other uh, example here. Here you have example even for geospatial, uh, formats, uh, or um, if you have to uh, start from scratch, so if, if in your case you don't have uh, any, any standard, you um, have the recipe in the FAIR cookbook on how to uh, shift from proprietary to open uh, standard data format. Uh, and here you go with the recommendation uh, coming from the ALEA report, specifically tailored for uh, humanities, okay? Again, about uh, repositories, again, about persistent identifier, and again, about, you see here, um, community-based standard, okay? Um, so let's converge 
to the tools your community uh, is using. So to be findable, you need metadata and persistent identifier. To be accessible, you need a repository and you need uh, open formats. And to be interoperable, you need a standard. Uh, in order to be uh, findable, you need metadata and persistent identifiers. In order to be accessible, you need a place somewhere where to put your data, so um, a repository or even a data journal, but not in the humanities. And um, and you need formats. In order to be interoperable, you need uh, standards. So uh, if you don't know what standards are, you can refer to this uh, Partenos um, web page uh, or to this uh, standardization uh, survival kit provided by uh, Humanum. Uh, Dealea, uh, let's say Dealea um, recommendations uh, focuses on the use of authority files, uh, normalized, let's say, um, information, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. And um, of course, you um, you can uh, let's say you can use uh, authority files like you know. Uh, the virtual international authority files, uh, Wikidata, uh, geonames, or something like, uh, like this. Uh, Besides uh, standards, to be interoperable, you need ontologies. Uh, again, the Partenos project gives us an idea of what formal ontologies exist uh, for the digital uh, humanities. And here you go with a perfect example, in my opinion, of let's say the, the open methodology. Uh, you need to create an ontology. Uh, it comes from Francesco Beretta, researcher at the CNRS in Lyon. Um, using Ontomy, uh, they created uh, an ontology for, uh, they are creating, not, not the, it's, it's ongoing. Uh, so they, they create this, um, they are creating this ontology for history. But what, what I, uh, find interesting in this in this article by Francesco is the method okay is the methodology that's why I've put in the in the slide because I, I think it can be useful uh, also for uh, for other disciplines but to be uh, interoperable uh, let's say the tool with a capital T uh, is a fair sharing fair sharing uh, is a registry uh, of as you can see here uh, standards and by standards, we, means, uh, we mean uh, ontologies, uh, metadata schema, um, uh, thesaurus, uh, control vocabularies, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, you can um, search uh, by discipline, uh, by domain. Uh, so it, it's really um, a very important tool in order to make uh, your data fair. And again, it's community driven. So if you don't find your uh, standard here, you can contact the team and um, have your standard included in fair sharing. Other recommendation uh, specifically tailored for humanities in the ALEA uh, report. So to be uh, interoperable, you needed ontologies and standards. To be reusable, you need, first of all, a documentation. Um, it's in your own interest as researchers uh, to avoid, again, misinterpretation or misuse of your data and also help uh, keeping integrity about uh, your data. Because if you document the process you use to, to collect and to process Data. Um, basically, it's, it's the read mile. Uh, you again, it helps keeping integrity on your data. And here you go from the SESDA uh, expert training um, guide uh, what you have to document, okay, at data level or uh, at project uh, level. So, here again, tips and tricks uh, about documentation. And here you have examples of what you have to document, for instance, for uh, with quality, qualitative um, data. Uh, and why not? Why not using uh, an open notebook? I don't know if you are familiar with open notebooks. Uh, open notebook, I, I would say, uh, can be 
really a revolution in the scholarly communication system. Because in the open notebook, you know, it's an environment in which you can put your, uh, your text, text so you you explain uh, the, the methodology you explain the results and so on and so forth but you can also put your data you can you can put uh, live code so it's uh, ex executable uh, so basically you have everything uh, in a, in a single environment so my my question would be uh, do we still need uh, journals to share our research if we can share uh, an open notebook, because in the notebook you can find really uh, everything, not just the final synthesis of your research in form of an, a journal article. And don't think that open notebooks are just for um, STM, just for the, let's say, hard sciences. Uh, you can also so use electronic lab notebooks uh, for uh, the humanities. So if you are interested in this, please go and refer to this uh, website. Then to be reusable beside documentation, you need uh, licenses. Um, and remember that raw data are not protected by copyright. Uh, I know it's difficult to, let's say, to digest, but that, that's the way it is because copyright um, protects the creativity, okay? So the, the copyright does not, uh, co um, copyright protects, let's say, the, the expression, uh, the creative expression you gave to, uh, to an idea, but it does not cover, it, it not, does not protect um, basic information and raw data, okay? Uh, so you basically you can't say data are mine okay it's not like a paper and uh, i think you can see it in this uh, in this uh, figure on raw data and information there is no copyright and rightly so because if if i can put copyright let's say on an information like uh, today in turin is cloudy and we have uh, 20 degrees i would be the only one in the world uh, which who can say today in turin is cloudy and we have 20 degree and you have to ask me permission uh, to use this information so that's why uh, raw data and uh, basic information has no copyright if we have a non-creative database, then we can apply the so-called sui generis uh, database directive, which you can see here. And if we have a creative database, we can also apply uh, copyright, okay? Beside the sui generis um, right on, on, on databases. But uh, we need to have a database and the database is defined a collection of independent works, data, or other materials arranged in a systematic or uh, methodical way. Then uh, the sui generis, in any case, even, uh, even though you have a database, so not raw data, but database, so a collection, blah, blah, the sui generis database right protects the substantial effort in obtaining the data. So it's basically an economic. Uh, effort. Uh, the sui generis right uh, lasts 20 years and the copyright lasts 70 years. But anyway, so it, it's, it's, it's different and it protects the uh, economic effort in uh, obtaining uh, the data. Even when you can apply a copyright to a creative database, uh, the copyright in this case protects the structure so the selection, uh, the, the, let's say the, the um, uh, systematization that you gave to your data and not the content. So never uh, the data contained in, um, in the database. So I hope this is clear. Uh, if it's, uh, um, okay. Um, in the humanities, we have another layer uh, of uncertainty, let, let's put it this way, uh, because uh, many times uh, we uh, have uh, corpora, uh, we uh, deal with um, cultural heritage materials. So uh, please refer to this uh, chapter uh, of the Digital Technology and Practice of Humanities Research edited by uh, Jennifer Edmond 
uh, to refer to these uh, issues. If you want to go deeper into this idea of data uh, which are not protected by copyright, and of course, um, you can have other form of legal protection, but not copyright. Um, and you also have to deal with uh, GDPR. You can refer to this open air uh, webinar uh, held by Thomas Margoni and Prodromos uh, Tsiavos, uh, among others. Uh, or um, you can access the, you can read this paper by Ludovica Pazeri. She's a young researcher from the University of Tuli Turin now a PhD at the University of uh, uh, Bologna. And you can also make use of these three guides uh, provided by uh, OpenAir. So how do I know if my research data is protected? Uh, how do I license my research data? And can I use someone else's research data? They are very clear. Again, uh, Thomas Margoni is really an expert on this field. If you need something about GDPR and research, you can go and uh, make use of this uh, precious, uh, I would say, uh, website. And you can also read this fact sheet uh, provided by Creative Commons, um, which perfectly explains that the only um, uh, accepted, or, or le let's put it this way, uh, Legally, so from a legal point of view, uh, the only uh, possible license for data is the CC0, so the dedication to public domain, okay? Uh, because you have no copyright, so even a CC BY, uh, um, so the attribution uh, is, no, uh, is not suitable for data because there is no copyright, so uh, who can, uh, whom who can you attribute the, the data? This doesn't uh, applying a CC0 license does not mean in any way uh, to become uh, academically uh, unpolite, okay? Because whenever you use uh, a source, uh, you have to cite it, okay? So the, the suggestion is to apply a CC0, which is the only legal um, suitable license for data, and then you associate to your data set uh, a sentence, uh, meaning a, a template uh, in, um, with a sentence uh, providing the citation, okay? Well, a sentence uh, with, with which you want to get uh, credit uh, for the use or reuse of your, um, of your data set. If you have to license software. Excuse me, because we have. And uh, as we have only 15 minutes late, I just uh, wanted to make sure that we could yeah, have yeah, some yeah. discussion with the, with the audience. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm almost finished. But we, we had also this, you know, interruption. So <laughs> it's not just me being late. Uh, so if you have to license uh, software, you have this uh, wizard uh, helping you in choosing the, the best license for your uh, software. And again, you have from the ALEA report something specific for uh, legal aspects on in the uh, humanities. Uh, the concept should be to be, again, as open as possible. So even for licenses, please choose the most open uh, license. Don't put unnecessary uh, barriers. That, that's the message. Then, uh, in ending the, this, this uh, let, let's say, um, part on, on fair data, uh, we have some recommendation from the, from the Opera SP uh, website and mostly uh, preserve the domain specificity, uh, produce an inventory of existing verification tool and provide training, which is what we are doing uh, today. Just a few words, I, I would, I, I swear it's just three minutes um, about the data management plan, because it's the tool in which you put all the information about uh, your data. Uh, it's a living document, so it grows with the projects, but you have to start from the beginning in order to avoid uh, mistakes. And it's also the right venue uh, to and all the more so if you are funded by the European Commission in Horizon Europe, the data management plan is the place where you justify your choices if you keep your data open or closed. 
is not uh, a matter of learning how to draft a DMP. The matter is to learn how to responsibly manage your data. Okay, the, the DMP is just a reflection uh, of uh, of that. It's a, it's a it's a real responsibility you take with the community, and it's a powerful tool for you to think about uh, your uh, data in a different way. You need to be synthetic and specific. Uh, so let's use uh, tables, bullet points. Uh, it's not a decision. So it's, it's like a serving suggestion or, um, yeah, about your data. Do not copy paste because every data set is unique. Uh, every research uh, is different. Uh, being generic is useless. Uh, these are sentences I, I found in some data uh, DMP. Uh, at the University of Turin, a sentence like, we expect a huge size of, da of data is useless uh, because you have to quantify uh, if you are, for instance, uh, if your data are more than uh, 50 gigabytes, uh, you have to pay even in Zenodo, okay? And don't show off, okay? Uh, so just state what you are really uh, going to uh, do. Other uh, tips and tricks uh, from, uh, from the Dutch uh, coalition of data stewards. Uh, you have a guide to data management plan uh, provided by Science uh, Europe. Um, you have some core requirements. So you have some sections it, you have to put in a DMP. And in the latest um, edition of this guide by Science Europe, you also have a, a rubric for, uh, for evaluate the goodness uh, and the soundness of your uh, DMP. Uh, there are some questions you have to, to ask yourself about your data. Uh, you can go uh, through them. And you have something uh, specifically uh, tailored for the humanities provided by the University of California. And then the tool you, uh, you, uh, I suggest to use is the DMP online. Uh, you can customize it even for your project or whatever. And uh, you uh, will have a tool online, um, you see, um, with every section you can uh, fill in. And in the end, so you can generate uh, your PDF, uh, your, sorry, DMP online. And then in the end, you click on uh, download um, DMP and the DMP uh, is done, okay? In, in the format, you, uh, you need it, a PDF or an XML or whatever. So it's really um, a powerful tool I can recommend. And with that, we are uh, done. So uh, Arno, if you have some uh, questions. Yes, um, I mean, first to thank you for, uh, for your presentation. It was very rich. And like I thought, I learned some things in, in there. Uh, I'm just adding a little piece of information. We <clears throat> uh, recently launched a blog on the verification of the SSH. I'm just putting the link in the chat. It is managed by uh, our colleague, the community manager of Opress, Carla Vanson. And feel free to read. We'll <clears throat> communicate on this uh, very soon. You can also contact us to, to be an author if you want. So we had some questions in the chat. First, the technical one. Uh, people uh, were wondering if we would have the, the, the actionable links in the presentation to the video from the health train, for instance, and also the various uh, sources. But I think everything is sourced and everything is uh, accessible from your presentation, right? Yeah. In the, in the PDF, uh, there will be the, the, uh, the link are activable in, in uh, the, the link are active. In, in the PDF, sorry. And I've also uh, put, but I have to check if my connection at home managed to do it because I've put them in Zenodo. So I can give you the link. Let me check. Um, maybe you can also, you can, you can read me an You're, you're muted, uh, Elena. Yeah, but I, I was just checking on okay. uh, on Zenodo if the slides are there. So ju just to give you the DOI in Zenodo, let me check. 
Okay. Save. Publish. We are going live. So live you have this link i this link i put in the chat is the link to the pdf version of the slides and then once i go back to to my office i can give you also the powerpoint okay perfect thank you uh, so then there was a <clears throat> there were two questions before in the chat <clears throat> and so the first one was the, was the beginning of the presentation uh, and the question was from Vitaly and um, I report and copy paste the question in, in the chat so the question is about the, the books are there research data it is actually one of the key assumption of operas that books are also research data in the context yeah. of the SSH but I'll let you elaborate a bit on this if you want yeah of course and and it's an example of 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 raw data <laughs> it's it, you you are right uh, you are right because you know um as we as we said at the beginning uh, um, in the humanities there is always uh, interpretation okay there is always this human the the, the subjectivity of the researcher so uh, yeah in my opinion they are uh, they are uh, raw data for other for further researchers so you are not sure i would say I, i'm sure and all the all the most so uh, for instance if you are a researcher uh, i would say a, a philologist or something like this or um, so you you need to for you let's say the, the book of i don't know dante alighieri is your source so it's your raw data um, another example of raw data in the humanities is qualitative interview, of course, yes, they are. And as I told you at the beginning, there is no recipe because every data set, every research is unique. And that's why we need uh, data stewards uh, with a specific um, data domain uh, skills and competencies uh, because it's up to them, okay? to give you all the, the tools or to find or even to create the tools in order to make you your data fair in a specific domain. Okay, yes, no, of course, I agree that the, the books are scientifically the research data, but I would add also that they are technically anyway, digital data that we are managing on the publishing platform, just as on other data with PIDs, metadata and so on. So it's actually, yeah closer than we could think. Then there was another question. I don't know if it stayed after the, the incident from uh, Godefroy, Godefroy, and it was about, could be pasted uh, again in the, in the chat, and <clears throat> you addressed actually this, this question during the presentation. Yeah. I don't know, Godefroy, if you're here, if you want to be more precise about your question, or if you think it has been answered by the yeah, metadata. Yeah, if you want a definition yes. of metadata, metadata are uh, data about data. So uh, it's the way in which you describe your data. If you think that the, the um, I, I would say the simplest example of metadata is when you have a book. Uh, metadata of the book are the author, uh, the title, the publisher, the year of publication. Uh, the city of the publisher and, and go on, the number of pages, the language of the book. These are the metadata. So the data describing uh, other data. I don't know if you are happy with this answer. I think we can be, and like I said, anyway, it was a, you, had it, you had even that slide on the different types of metadata. I think that was the question. Yeah, it wasn't, thank you. So, uh, does anyone else want to ask a question either in the chat or directly? Ah, but good for you, you are right. How many uh, of my researchers have this question? Uh, yes, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's precisely uh, the reason why we need training. Uh, it's the reason why uh, we need data stewards, okay? Because researchers uh, you you can think about uh, you can think of a researcher uh, going and addressing uh, all the tools we we saw uh, this afternoon. So that that's why they need support, but they also need a 
let's say, basic training, uh, for instance, uh, about metadata. So what, is, what are metadata, what are uh, persistent identifier and so on. So it's really very, very basic. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, I, don't know, I can see there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to yeah, ask. I can see. How, how is the return on investment for FAIR? It's huge. Um, in the slides, um, you will find the... Um, Oh no, here you don't have so, but, but anyway, th there is mentioned uh, this uh, paper uh, written by Baron Mons in Nature, uh, calling for the 5% uh, of the um, research of the yeah of the research funds uh, to go for data stewardship, and in this article, uh, Barend shows how the returns on investments are huge. Uh, first of all, because researchers uh, at at the moment, researchers um, spend like 80%, 80, so 80, 80% of their time in, uh, let's say, uh, cleaning the data uh, before they can use it or uh, in other technical stuff. So if they can find the data in a fair way, uh, this 80% of time is saved. So this is a, the first, let's say, return on investment. Then if you have, um, if your data are reusable, uh, and that's the point of the EOS, that's the point of, of the mandate in, uh, in Horizon 2020 and in Horizon Europe, if you can reuse other researchers' date, again, that data, sorry, uh, again, uh, is, uh, is, um, you can save money because you don't have to recreate or to recollect or to regenerate the data, but you can reuse them. And that's that. That's I. I would say the uh, the I the, the the yeah the highest return on on investment, and then you have the point that data uh, created bridges. I mean, when your data are there, they can be reused by different researchers, not only from your discipline. Okay, and. Uh, that's particularly true for, for social sciences data. For instance, if you take a data set about uh, um, uh, mortality, okay, uh, you can access them from uh, the point of view uh, of a health practitioner, but also of a scientist uh, dealing with pollution, with air pollution, for instance, to see if there is a linkage between air pollution and the mortality rate or something like that. So having data uh, available uh, is really uh, the, the best return on investment for a, for a funder. And that's why the European Commission is insisting on, 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 um, on fair data and on the, the use of the European Open Science Cloud. Thank you for this rich answer. There is a, yeah, there are some other uh, additions in the chat. I don't know, Iraklis, if we still have time to address these or anything. Uh, yeah, I think about we're gonna use 10 more minutes if. Okay. I don't know, okay. Uh, Elena, uh, could you uh, switch on your camera? Is it possible with? Uh, the connection or I can try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we can try. Okay, I don't thanks. Know. Okay, okay, you know. So there was a question as you can see about the, the more which, which one? The, the challenges. Yeah. Are there expecting ch expected challenge that we should uh, uh, wear off before in we implement adapt fair principle in our domain. Uh, which one is the critical challenge? Um, in the humanities, again, uh, our domain, I, I should know which is your specific domain. Because if you are an archaeologist, it's very different if you are, um, than if, if you are, uh, I don't know, um, a, a, a philologist, or if you are, uh, an historian or something like this. 
uh, but I would say that one common uh, challenge for, for the humanities uh, is the one uh, I showed you in the slide. So it's about the provenance. So when you use corpora or you use uh, cultural heritage uh, material or you use uh, digitized material, um, you, you are not sure about the rights. Okay, so that, that that's one point, and it's a it's it's common uh, in the humanities. And uh, um, another another uh, let's say common uh, issue or challenge uh, I was referring to during the presentation is the uneven uh, description of your resources. So sometimes you have rich metadata when you use corpora or or when you use uh, again. Um, uh, cultural heritage material. Sometimes you have a rich description, uh, sometimes not. So that, that could be a challenge. Then there is a comment uh, by Caroline. Just to add an example to this discussion about the books, uh, the main sources of our uh, five-year ERC funded project are historical books. Uh, written by naturalists, biologists, agronomists since the uh, 17th century, uh, sorry, the 16th century. Uh, we have loads of data there about the plants we study in a transdisciplinary way, and it's a very challenging data. Great, that, that's a good example. I will use it in my next uh, training. Then, uh, I, 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 I answered to answer to this one, okay? I don't know if you are happy with the, the answer, by the way. I think, yes, she, she, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's perfect. I guess we could uh, go on, on on this topic for quite a while. Uh, if there are no urgent questions, we will stop here. So, thank you again, Elena, and also for overcoming all the technical issues today. And <laughs> Having the presentation yeah. going on, yeah, and I, I will leave the floor for at least to close this webinar. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Elena, very much for your uh, rich talk and enlightening presentation, and thank you, Arno, for your comments and for coordinating the discussion. Uh, I think it was a very interesting uh, webinar. I hope that all the participants agree on this. Uh, so the next. Uh, Work, uh, the next webinar is on October 12. You can find the uh, uh, information on the triple website. And I want to apologize once again for the technical problem. Um, sorry for this, but I think that uh, Elena is a very good, uh, uh, a very good presenter, so she overcome this uh, problem. So thank you very much. All the Thank participants you. and Arno and Elena especially. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye, bye. Elena. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.